uh, Caroline mentioned earlier uncomfortable truths. And yesterday, um, when we did the little word cloud on what are some of the obstacles um, to collaboration, um, there was quite a few things around ego, uh, competing for funding, competing for visibility, racism was was really um, high up there. Um, I think those are really uncomfortable th roots that we definitely need to probably unpack if we're going to, you know, work together better and, and collaborate as a CDAC network. Um, and I do think leadership plays a huge role into this. Um, as you know, um, IFRC, WFP and the CHS Alliance are co-chairing the ISC AP task force with the support of our ISC colleagues who are here. Um, and um, we did a recommendations paper last year. And the first thing in the consultations we did um, was that uh, we needed more accountable leadership. We can't really move forward on this agenda without having leadership on board. And how do we make sure that affected communities are part of the decisions that are being made um, and are able to participate as well? Um, and there are small things that we can do that might encourage that kind of cultural shift that is still very much required. And as a relic, I can say we've been talking about this mindset shift that needs to happen, right? Um, for the whole humanitarian system to be more accountable, for communities to be able to have information and be able to participate in decisions. Um, and so to this day, our system, our humanitarian system and the way we work um, is still very hierarchical, right? I mean, that's not gonna change overnight, unfortunately. Um, but while we still work in what we have, we still, there are still changes that we can, um, we can kind of push for um, within this. And I think leadership has such a huge role to play. So on that note, um, I'm gonna hand over to the wonderful Stella who will, um, will moderate the session and hopefully ask some challenging questions and hopefully you can as well in your group work afterwards. Good morning, everyone. So my name is Stella Suge. I am the executive director of Filmmade Kenya, and we are very pleased to be, to be here and actually very pleased to have the opportunity to moderate uh, this session. So generally, since, um, since yesterday, I think, and also the remarks today from the board, the, the vision of uh, CDAC is one that um, all, all of us um, are committed to and are looking forward to it being moved uh, forward. And so basically now here we have um, the leadership from our membership, which is actually, I would say, a very strong and esteemed um, leadership who will actually uh, share with us what it is that they are doing at individual and organizational level to support the CDAC network to move the, the strategy forward. So we are, we are happy to, to have you and to interact, to have the, this dialogue session and see how we are able to get to, to a new point. <clears throat> Good morning. My name is Mago Gumo. I'm from Filmmade Kenya as well. Probably we should have had a coffee to first of all get to know each other. So we only met one of you um, from Kenya. So please, with your indulgence, just in case I mispronounced the names, I'm forgiven because we're really looking forward to your ideas. So in the panel today, we have Tristan Barnett, uh, the Chief of Mission in Manila, Philippines, for the International Organization for Migration and formerly the Deputy Director, Department of Operations, IOM Geneva. That was easy to pronounce. It gets harder. Um, we have the chair from the Intercluster Coordination Group, Chief System Wide Approaches and Practices Section, Coordination Division of OCHA. I'll pronounce the name Marina Skurich Prodanovic. Perfect. I was with some people last night, so I got some practicing. Um, from IRC, uh, the Vice President, Head of Technical Excellence, Aliosia Donofrio. We met before, so got that right. And from Fondation Irondel, um, is Caroline uh, Vuilemin, the Director General. Karibu sana. That's welcome in Kiswahili. We are pleased to have met uh, two of you earlier, so we are happy to meet uh, as well Tr um, Tristan and Marina. So we'll start with you, Marina, with the, really the, the growing evidence that AAP, accountability to affected populations, and communication, community engagement outcomes are really not 
where we expect them to to be um what are what are the changes that ocha has made over the last uh, two years great thanks so can you is that working i can't tell from here perfect so I'm going to start by channeling our boss, our collective boss, the emergency relief coordinator, Martin Griffith, uh, because I think he's really sort of set the stage um, since he's come on board and he's put AP squarely uh, on one of his list of priorities. This, of course, fits in within the broader uh, changes he really wants to drive in the system. And I think he's, his approach of both from a position of humanity, humility, deep sense of responsibility, but also really wanting to push us. Um, and I really want to encourage all of you who have not listened to his podcast on the new humanitarian to do so. I couldn't possibly do him justice, but he actually tells a very um, humbling story about what's really, I think, sparked his thinking, uh, meeting a refugee woman in 1997 in DRC, where I think that sort of sparked his realization that the power imbalance that exists in the sector, but also the deep responsibility we have to redress that balance within the system. So he's done that, obviously opening the CDAC General Assembly last year. He recently um, spoke um, at ECOSOC where we talked, he talked very um, extensively about a paradigm shift, about really needing to not just to listen to affected people, but really to be um, instructed by them. So he carries that with him. Um, I think he's done more than 15 field missions. Um, and he speaks every time to affected people. Um, and I think that sort of already um, sets the scene and, and, and um, really drives also what we all do. Um, we're going to have at the end of November, so him in his, um, in his role as emergency relief coordinator, um, he has obviously um, within the larger system reform where he's put PSEA protection, AP localization, also cash on the agenda. And I think he sees this as one of the integral elements of that. So um, for us as OCHA, he's pushed us hard on this. Um, we will have the principals listening to the findings um, and, and there will be the report from Ground Truth Solutions, which will also bring some of those perceptions um, of affected communities. And I think what we've been doing better as a system, and I'm not just going to say OCHA because OCHA is here to facilitate support and also lead, but it is really collective leadership that is critical. It is not, the onus is not on OCHA, the onus is on all of us. And we as OCHA play a very important role in this. So we've already had a lot of feedback um, collected by Grant with Solutions, by ALNAP, by many others. And here I'm going to bring it back to, you know, the what I call the three C's. The one is, do we actually even collect that feedback? Um, so that's the first C. Do we comprehend the feedback and what it's telling us? And then most importantly, the third C, do we collectively act on that feedback? And I think we've made, as a system, um, quite large steps in collecting the feedback. And we've made some significant steps in comprehending the feedback. Uh, but on the collective action, I think that still there's a lot of room for improvement. I think where there's been um, some commendable work being done, uh, also by my um, colleagues in OCHA, um, Rachel, for example, on AP, has been collective work on collective frameworks. We've had um, pilot tests, uh, piloting of the framework in places like Gaziantep, Lebanon, Bangladesh, Ethiopia. So this is all great. But now I'm going to bring it back to my role, and, and um, because I'm speaking here as the chair of the Global Cluster Coordination Group, um, I think what to me strikes me, and I go back to the third C, is too often we collect the feedback um, and we sort of try to comprehend it. And I think we've had a lot of good and positive work done by humanitarian country teams in doing that. But too often do I go in the field and I hear people saying, when I ask the question, do you collect feedback? Yes, we do. Do you, um, what do you do with the feedback? Well, we feed it back up to our agencies and to our donors. Do you share the feedback with others? Well, not really, we don't have the time. Do you collectively act on the feedback? And the answer is usually sometimes, and sometimes no, sadly. And, and more rarely, yes. So to me, this is really the critical part. Well, it is absolutely wonderful that we have an ERC who's really driving this. It's great that we have principals who are now really listening up. 
it is excellent that we have humanitarian country teams that are now listening to the feedback that Grant Rue Solutions is providing others. But we actually, we will only be successful once that those changes and that listening permeates every pore of the system, which is currently, I think, not doing. So I think in my role, um, I really try to push the clusters to make sure that they share, that they actually um, act on that feedback collectively and that they identify collective action because we cannot act in silos, which we currently do. So I think as OCHA and um, as an organization, because that was your original question, we certainly have pushed the envelope, we continue to push it. But, you know, it takes a village and it is not up to OCHA only to drive this. Um, it really takes every part of the system to do that. And I think on that, we really need to do better. We need to stop seeing this as a reporting requirement. We need to see it as our essential responsibility. And that's one that should really, really drive our work. And there, that permeation in every port, to me, that is really the critical part. And that many of you, all of you in the room and, and many others, play a really important role. And it's also about bringing those smaller members who are not necessarily part of IC global bodies to really also be part of that collective action. So that would be it in a nutshell. Back to you. So um, I was actually given a question here for follow-up. And excuse me, plenary, if I'm selfish, because I'm the one sitting here. But I was really struck by the way you mentioned the three Cs, collect feedback, comprehend feedback, and collective action. And I know you've spoken to some of the insights in terms of done better. And part of community engagement, the really difficult part is how you manage feedback. So, and I'm sorry if I take you back to this, if you've covered it, but you say that there's room for improvement when it comes to collective action. So what do you think succinctly should be done better to improve on that? Especially even for some, more or less, not even just the small organizations, even the big organizations when we're working. Um, well, I think just really discussing on what we need to do collectively and how we do it better. Um, and I think, look, it's great to have frameworks and I think they're super useful. But to me, it's really the basics. Before we had frameworks and when I started working in the sector, it's really about sitting down and acting as a team in talking and, and also including um, affected people in that decision making. And I think that inclusion of affected people, how we do that really is, is still is still an issue, right? Do we go and talk to groups of affected people in, in camps when we do, or do we just do our latrines and our health clinics and so on? I mean, just as an example, we um, recently had a um, joint mission of the Global Cluster Coordination Group, which went to South Sudan and that added value of going in as a team of people really trying to help and discussing, you know, because the existence of a latrine is going to affect um, the clinic and is going to affect the people and is going to affect everyone. So rather than looking at as individual interventions, really looking up at that sort of joint multi-sectoral engagement. And obviously, you know, when you speak to people, there are many other aspects. I, I briefly spoke about cash in the beginning. One of the um, things that um, Martin and, and his roles at ERC has been really driving forward, you know, cash, of course, gives choices to affected people if they so choose to choose cash as one of the modalities. And you go and talk to people and, you know, there will be a camp where you will have... One group of women who will want cash, the other won't, and you know the old ones perhaps will want it, and the young ones won't, because it will really depend on the context. But that we will not know unless we get to that level of granularity and understanding how can we best address and nuance the um, the response that we actually provide to them, and that's the only way that we're going to be successful, I think. Thank you. Um Thank you, Marina. Tristan, so I'll come to you. One of the, um, really, the, the vision of CEDAC is to shift um, the, the provision of aid development and humanitarian from global to local. 
and we know that IOM is uh, really a lead in, in, in the work that it is doing in the UN. We know that um, you are recognized in, in human mobility, but also the way the UN is structured as, as it has been is uh, very bureaucratic. It's you know very top down. So do you see it being practical to talk about even the UN agencies actually um, shifting really uh, AAP and CCE to, to this model of uh, local? I think we, can you hear me? Okay, sound like it's on. Um, I think we have to. Uh, this is a priority for the system and I think it's a priority because it's better programming. Um, it helps uh, foster trust. It helps ensure that we actually are meeting needs and needs in a way that um, are appropriate to the people and the people that we're serving, particularly marginalized groups that may not actually have access to for that programming might not be. So we need to change the way that we're doing. And I do think that there are strides. I don't think we've gone far enough, full stop. I think, I think it's going to be a long time before we ever get to the point where we actually want to be. Um, and that's probably good because we need ourselves. I do think that we've made some changes uh, during COVID. Uh, a, a pilot uh, localization pilot to make sure that a lot of the funding that went into the global humanitarian response plan for uh, COVID 25 million surf allocation IOM actually was the pass through grant but it was for one third of the NGO and community based which I think is very important they're the front line response. so many of these surf obviously governments, but also community-based organizations, uh, members. They're there before a crisis hit. They're there during it, and they're there afterward. Particularly if you're in a circumstance where you have conflict, complex operating environment, not only the frontline response, sustainability. So it, it, it's or your programming. The other thing, you guys aren't telling me the truth. Um, no, I'm kidding. Uh, but there are also, I think, innovative methods. You know, you look at our teams on, our, on the ground, and there are ways of doing it. I've been in the now for, I'm fairly fresh. Uh, but one of the things that impressed me on the ground were the teams that set up this um, community monitoring. So members of the local community uh, being targeted by traffickers or targeted by violent extremists, um, they were... A but the difference is that this community members, along with government representatives, play an active role in actually monitoring whether or not they're making an impact, looking at the health of livestock, looking at whether or not the business is thriving, but also coming back from the community safety and I have to speak in the mic. Thank you. I'm not very good. <laughs> Thank you for keeping me accountable. <laughs> um, and so we're not always hearing things we want to hear. But the important thing is that there is a mechanism to provide that, and it's owned by the people that are on the ground and the people that are going to be there for the long term. And so I think one of the things that we need to make sure is that not only do we have the capacity to actually receive that feedback, but we need to have the bona fide willingness to do something with it. Um, and we need to talk to the donors to make sure that we can um, alter our programming based on that feedback, because we, we can't just say we don't have the money. We can't just say, you know, donors are inflexible and they can be inflexible, but there's a multifaceted approach to this that requires many different levels of engagement. And, um, well, I think those are a couple examples. And of course, under the, uh, the IASC, commitments really pushing this year to move from not just individual agents, the accountability measures, but collective. Um, PSEA, I was involved in that for quite a few years. 
that evolved from individual to collective and they're still struggling but it's moving and i really really am reassured by the fact that this is an ifc task force priority this year because it can't just be a siloed approach we need to have that collective as well so um a long-winded way of saying uh i think this has to happen uh, I think it's uncomfortable. I think we need to make sure that leadership is engaged with our teams and making sure that not only is it being integrated in programming, but they're actually participating in um, all of the country level, uh, as well as regional and, and international, but more country level um, working groups to push this integrated into the programming side. Uh, so I think we don't have a choice. But we've got good team members and we have community members that really know what they need, so we just got a brand management background before I became a true humanitarian, whatever that means. Uh, sitting here, if because it sounds like IOM has made like really significant changes. So if you are like I'm your student and I'm trying to learn what drove that success in change, mm -hmm. and two key things. Consider, if you want to drive change for IOM, what are the two key things that brought about this change that you are so successful in it? I know you're talking about changing completely is a long time, and maybe you know, we have to look through all these sustainability structures, but the two key th things to keep in mind are the takeaway to drive change, what would they be? There really needs to be a philosophical shift in how we approach programming. Um, we need to truly listen and be prepared to hear the responses and take action on it. I, I don't want to... I hesitate to bring up policy, but I think policy frameworks are important if you make it mandatory. So we have a um, accountability to effective populations framework that puts forward all of our principles and commitments, et cetera. But what's important is that it was made mandatory and it's been embedded within our internal governance framework. And so there's a mandatory responsibility for um, every staff person operating in a crisis scenario uh, to take certain types of training. And actually last year, um, it was the highest record of IOM staff uh, taking a, an online course uh, over all the other uh, courses. So I think that it's slowly trickled down. We're trying to embed it everywhere in all of our, um, all of our uh, top to technical level. But again, I think it's a shift in how we approach it. So there's no easy answer. But unless you have senior leadership pushing it and holding country leadership accountable, it's going to be just another tick boxing exercise. And they're not going to truly incorporate the principles and behind it. And this is close to me because I'm involved in some projects together with IRC around information. So we know a number of noteworthy IRC projects uh, linked to improving engagement with communities, um, such as IRC's client-driven protection information services and the signpost collaboration initiative. In Kenya, we also have julisha.info, and it's great now we're partnering with IRC again because it's so social media driven, right? I know I'm old, but I live a life of denial. I want to engage youth. And so that's why we're really working together on Julisha. So in your role as head of technical excellence, have you seen a change at the institutional and systems level of IRC in how it does business to ensure and assure two-way communication and systematic engagement with communities? Yes. <laughs> no, so, that's it let's go home <laughs> so sorry uh, just again microphone check is that okay great. um so no that's a great question and um but i am going to do what we, i think we were warned not to do at the beginning of the day and, and i'm going to nitpick about one word and there's a reason for this that word is ensure and if we think about if we think about how what it takes to ensure good two-way communication between two individuals and how heavy a responsibility that is whether that's two colleagues or a, 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 a friendship or, or for that matter a parenting relationship or whatever there's a lot of effort involved and that's not the world that we operate in we operate in something that's at a vast scale um and so 
one of the things I often tell my colleagues is, can we please strike that word ensure from our humanitarian vocabulary? And can we bring in a little bit more humility to what it is that we're trying to do? Because there isn't, there isn't some magic. Driving towards insure is driving towards the checkbox uh, mentality. And I think what we, what we want to be thinking about is how do we encourage, we um, motivate, how do we monitor, how do we uh, um, check and, and improve and learn. And those are the sort of verbs that I try to sort of encourage in, when we're thinking particularly, whether we're talking about accountability populations when we're talking about uh, communicating effectively with uh, communities it, it, it really is uh, um, a challenge when you're sort of uh, empl you, you count your employees in the tens of thousands the, the the people you seek to serve in the in the millions and the and, and the resources that you're mobilizing in the hundreds of millions unfortunately even now billion apparently um, that is the scale uh, we're, that is a scale at which it's very, very difficult to um, actually understand what is going on. And so that is the challenge that I'm trying to grapple with, along with my colleagues in senior management at the IRC. So how do we approach this? Uh, speaking, there's, a, there's a sort of three um, the elements to this. I think the first is about setting expectations. Uh, so we've heard the word frameworks a few times. We, too, uh, you know, have a framework for program quality that we've that up that also that calls out very strongly um, uh, both how we partner with with uh, uh, a variety of, of actors in the context in which we intervene, but also calls out very strongly uh, a, a, what we call client centered could be community centered could be beneficiary centered in other people's language. We've landed on the word clients because we wanted to shake the word that all the complacency that was around the word beneficiary. Uh, and this idea that people automatically benefit from the thing they do, and so we just wanted to sort of mess mess with people's language a bit, so we used clients. That has already now ossified and become part of the problem, so we'll probably shake that up again in the not-too-distant future. But anyway, for now, <laughs> client-centered. How do we engage clients? How do we bring people into, uh, uh, you know, how do we listen uh, effectively and, and act on that information? How do we... How do we um, bring decision-making closer, uh, closer to our clients. So that's laid out in a framework. It's, it's, um, it's brought to life through departmental plans, through uh, individual country strategy action plans, commitments that are made in those plans, that are tracked, that are resourced. It's obviously a big step forward for us because we've tended to make lots of promises in the past and then not put resources behind it. So we're trying to give country teams flexible resources to experiment and to improve and to to uh, follow through on their commitments and then tracking and accountability built built around that that's given rise to loads of good micro practices um, the tricky thing now for us is uh, so micro practices or, or, or decentralized decision making is great and we try to support it obviously what's then becomes a challenge is when you've got a lot of um, uh, really good ideas blossoming all over the place is how do you lift them up, learn from them, not lose that knowledge and learning, share them into other areas and, and make sure that people are using uh, what they're learning at a, in a systematic way. So it's not just a great thing happening in one country in Uganda, but it becomes a different way of doing some core part of our business. So that's, that's the first piece is setting expectations. The second piece is just kind of trying to actually measure and monitor what's going on. So this, this concept of data and analysis that's been talked about again by, by other panelists. Um, you know, we, we uh, five, six years ago, we were lamenting the absence of data about, I was lamenting, I wrote stuff lamenting the absence of data about client um, beneficiary community perspectives in the humanitarian data world. So can count the money we spend really easily. We can count the objects that we move around from one place to another very easily. We find it much harder to quantify the more um, nuanced and, and subtle aspects of the work that we do. So we, we partner with Ground Truth Solutions, as many have. We, we've experimented uh, different ways of of surveying and, and, and distilling the results of those surveys, and that's now becoming much more part of, a, of, of business as usual. 
But that brings us to the third piece, which is what do you do with that data, right? The 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 end that our, our, my fellow panelists have, have referred to, and and I think that's the piece where we're really digging in at the moment. So um, we're trying to get um, so some of this is open to technological solutions. So can we can we bring different data sets together in ways in dashboards? Can we visualize data in ways that really make it easier for people? So that's one part of it puzzle but how do we bring that into you know that we often hear about things like well we need to bring this into management routines which all sounds very you know credible until you actually look at those management routines and realize that management routines are pretty patchy at best because people are operating in uh, high stress environments uh, with a, a, a time deficiency exacerbated by the fact that nasty headquarters people like me can pop up anywhere online at any time, um, as 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 referenced in the previous <laughs> session. So, you know, how how do we? Uh, so we we we're then sort of driving into kind of can we simplify and codify as simply as possible the minimum sort of expectations we have about how often and how data is being looked at and against what sort of benchmarks and so how is that feedback from uh, from beneficiaries, from clients, from communities being looked at alongside other performance metrics and can that feed interesting conversations in project teams, in country management, ultimately at kind of regional and, and global level. So that's going on. You see one of the one of the um, other key things to, to remember in the way that we work, we're a very we're donor funded very project-based um, organization, and the vast majority of uh, consequential decisions about what's going to happen take place at design phase. Um, we can pivot while we're implementing, but the broad parameters are set at the time we ask for some money um, and, and built a case for that. So. Um, that's that's kind of where we're trying to drive. So we're really sort of focusing now on uh, how we can drive design processes at further forward in time, so they become less time pressured, so that we can actually have greater dialogue with with um, with our clients about what they want, what they need, how they want it, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, so that we can actually design in a, in a more collaborative fashion. And that's really the, the the sort of I think the next phase in trying to kind of drive this into a large organisation. Like I said, it's it's a challenge. Um, so in, in terms of um, the learnings that you have from the experience and I would say, you know, the, the investment that you have actually made to go in this uh, direction, what really are the, are the key learnings uh, if, when you talk about, say, for example, the client-centered approach that you can actually share with us are the highlights that, you know, as humanitarian, we can actually carry forward and, um, you know, try to include in, in our approaches and our programming? So I, I think, I mean, okay, I, one thing I haven't spoken about is I think that the cash shortcut that was mentioned by other um, analysts, I think, and that remains, I think, a really important um, a really important strategy in the sense that um, we as an industry can overcomplicate things and drive towards um, you know, how do we have the perfect way to communicate with people in order to design the best intervention? Or we could just give them the resources and let them figure it out, right? So I think there is this cash shortcut that is, um, a lot of noise was being made about a few years ago, has fallen a little bit off the agenda, and I do think is worth um, refocusing on. You do cash well, you don't need to do a lot of other things. You can actually slim down the bureaucracy and you can slim down the aid industry. So that's, I think, a one big vote I would give. The other I would just say, like, obviously, all of our organizations are different, but you need to figure out a way to um, set expectations and, and monitor to those expectations and do so in a way that actually um, stimulates what you're trying to get at and doesn't introduce perverse incentives. There are really... Um, there are ways that you can misuse, uh, for example, client feedback data by aggregating it or comparing it in ways that actually are quite detrimental to improving programming. So there's a sort of warning light that needs to be built into the system where you're thinking about, well, what are we actually looking at here and how, what, what kind of um, 
decisions or, or, or are we making on the basis? Thank you. So let me come to you, uh, Caroline. So I, th I think, you know, some of the buzzwords that uh, we, we talk about that we are accustomed to is really that the work that we are doing is, is about the client, is client-centered, is community-centered. And, you know, in your, in your experience, this is really about the inclusion of the people that we are working in. So do you see the, um, the, the shift that we need to make really being about in you know including the diversity of the communities that um, we are working with or you think that you know the experience that um, you have wherever you you are sitting is enough so in in the sense that you there is a community sitting somewhere in the field that you're serving but also you know you have country teams it at some you know at an Nairobi level london level do you see that that this need to to really have the diversity of the communities that we are serving. Thank you. Um, well, I'm standing from a very different reality from the other panelists. You know, Fondasui Hondel creates media and manages newsroom. And one of our key principles and value is inclusion, and it starts from the composition of the newsroom. Um, and so thinking inclusion you have to think when you work in the media, of course, who you want to talk to and the reach you want to have. Um, it is about the capacity to cover large areas on media that are accessible to people easily. This is why radio remains a key uh, media for many, many countries and many people. It's about inclusion through languages. Um, speaking to people in the language they can actually understand and uh, respond and ask questions and be part of the conversation. And so for us, we try to have in the newsroom the mirror of the society. And it's not only gender and, um, you know, languages, which very often match either ethnic or geographical um, background and, and uh, location, it's also age, uh, which is a key element uh, in, in media and you know, the way people see the world. So from that inclusion in the newsroom, you have better chance to include in the topic you're going to cover in getting um, a better sense of the pulse of the society um, uh, and have a better inclusion. But then there is the, the challenge of, you know, a lot of the programs being either because it's from the donor's request or because it's easier to produce marketed, if I may say, to a specific public. We're going to do a youth program. We're going to do a refugee program. We're going to do a women's program. And, and that has its advantages and um, disadvantages because to talk about gender, to talk about, um, you know, the issues of refugees. I'm thinking of Burkina Faso, for instance, one and a half million people displaced internally, not into refugee camps, but coming to villages and areas if they're in their own country, very little resources. You cannot just talk to the refugee. You have to talk to the whole population about what's going on and why. Talking about women, we always say we need the men in the room, we need the men in the conversation. So the, the idea of um, marketing or targeting, if I may say, I don't like this word, but uh, audiences to sp address specific issues and not thinking inclusion and other parts of the, the people is for me one of the the, the challenges that uh, very often donors don't understand are humanitarian actors because they want to target the specific people in the camps or in um, the displaced um, areas. And, and as a media actor, we have to always explain the approach. And if you're going to reach the national state or like the, the national space, it's not the same program than if you work with a community radio at the local level for a very um, uh, specified uh, area. And, and there you may have inclusion in that specified very little area, but you cannot have inclusion with the rest of the country or the rest of the region. So you have to know your, your limitation. Um, what we 
try to do uh, in terms of, you know, having um, a better sense from what are the people needs, what are the people questions. Of course, the journalists need to have their network, they need to, to be able to sense that, but it's, it's not enough. Um, you do audience survey, that's a must in any uh, media business. But even that is uh, today very difficult in many places in terms of uh, accessing or in some remote areas or for security reasons. You cannot really do phone surveys. Um, because not everybody um, is accessible by phone and everything. Uh, we, we tried a, a pilot um, process in Burkina Faso uh, using uh, WhatsApp vocal messages with the University of Sheffield. Um, we used the community radio we work with in Burkina to identify in the displaced communities people who'd accepted to give their phone number. There is ethic and protection of data uh, associated with the research, of course. Um, and we uh, gave them credit so they could um, receive the programming um, the audio files on WhatsApp. We could also listen to them on the FM radio, but sometimes the timing was the right moment for them to listen. So they had the audio file, they could listen to it, and they could provide feedback. And um, one of the strengths of WhatsApp is that audio function. You don't have to know how to write, you don't have to know how to read. It's very easy. And we got a lot of feedback from the displaced people um, that were fed in the newsroom, adapt the program and to improve the program. So it, it's related to what do you do um, with the, the, the feedback you get. And it's not easy to go back to a newsroom and to tell journalists you have to change what you thought was needed. You have to think differently. You are in Ouagadougou, you're not like 400 kilometers away. Uh, it's, a, it's another reality and, and that is not easy. There is a lot of uh, pedagogy and uh, ownership for the journalist, uh, humility also, to accept that, okay, what they thought the program should be is not going what it's going to be. Um, and so at my level, I'm trying to really work with the, the group I can directly have an impact on, which is my people, my staff, the journalist, to have them accept this feedback and how to think in the programming for end uh, beneficiaries or user or listeners and consumers mission so that we are as um, adequate, as relevant and as useful as possible. So Caroline, like our brands are somewhat similar and I could really feel you in what it is that you're saying. And I'm just doing one quick follow-up. And if your donors are here, we're having an open discussion, right? This is like group therapy. When you say it about mar target marketing, I know you don't like that term, but let's just use it. And the donors already drive you towards just within a certain group. And you're like, you have to work with all these other groups as well to make it more inclusive. Honest conversation. Have you had any success engaging them to change that thinking? And if you have, how did you make that happen? If you haven't, you can be like Alyosha, just saying, no, I have not had any luck. Because we could learn from you. Yeah, uh, it, it depends. Um, you know, I think we, the way we manage is because we um, create or support media that are generalist and global in their editorial ambition. So when you have a generalist media, it could be a radio, it could be a website, um, you always find in the programming the time and a place or a slot to address the issue, knowing that you have other moments in the day or in the week where you will, talk, you will be talking to other part of the population. What is difficult is when you have very limited um, hours or uh, yeah, uh, available uh, support. And um, I, I had the discussion with, with you, for instance, um, because they are 
one of the <laughs> key <laughs> donor thinking, you know, women thinking youth uh, separately from the rest of the population. And, and um, one of the uh, response I gave them in, in, in Mali, in Sahel, they were like, you have to talk to the youth, you have to talk to the youth. And I was like, you know, it's more than 50% of the population. So yes, I'm going to be talking to them. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, we want to reach uh, the maximum people and they are the maximum people. So it's not that I'm going to be talking to the youth. I have to design programs so that they um, get their voice, they get what is it of interest to them because I want to talk to the majority of the people anyway. Um, thank you, Caroline. So let me come back to, to you again, eh, Marina. So. In, in Kenya, where we, we are operating, so there's really one big crisis around uh, refugees in flux and, and the long-term existence of the, of the camps. But also now we are facing the, the drought crisis and there is, you know, there is the fact that it's in the entire region of Eastern Horn and a lot of, the, you know, the, um, the coordination is actually being done from Nairobi. A lot of the actors are, are there. But, you know, we continue to experience significant challenges in really communication, engagement and accountability. And, you know, I think looking at your role um, um, at, at OCHA, what are really the, the specific things that you're doing to, to support country teams like in Kenya uh, to, you know, to better coordinate and really to, to see a change in, in accountability at the local level? Right. I'm now having a very <laughs> strong effect on this microphone. Um, so I can't speak to the specificity of Kenya, but I think what we would be doing in Kenya is what we would be doing in, um, anyway. So why, first of all, um, the collective framework, it's making sure that there is one. Second is obviously OCHA um, facilitates and chairs uh, the work of the intercluster coordination group. And that is sort of a critical part to actually having, we've been talking about integrating um, feedback. Um, that is the critical forum where you can make sure that that feedback is actually listened to and reflected uh, upon and, and collectively acted upon. And actually, as I was listening to my fellow um, panelists speak, I was thinking we should add a fourth C, which is change, because uh, it's not just about collectively act, it's also the willingness to change. Um, look, Again, I, I can't speak to the specificities of Kenya, but I think what we have learned in the more recent crisis, such as um, Ukraine um, and others, is that every context brings new challenges. And even what we do in terms of affected people in one really will not necessarily apply. I think we went into Ukraine with a lot of um, perhaps some assumptions and um, lack of knowledge of how quickly the situation will move. And I think this is about being open-eyed and open to change and open to realizing that actually what you've used in context X is not going to work in context Y. Um, and I think that is um, super important. Communities are different. Um, they have different levels of access um, to different types of feedback loops, um, they have preferences. I think we learned in some contexts you have very digitally um, savvy populations, um, good mobile networks, and so on. Certainly, I think what we also do, try to do in crisis, and um, we haven't actually um, done this for a while, is we do have something called the GSC, uh, GS, uh, GSMA um, mobile network agreement, where we can hook on, and I actually want to um, encourage everyone who's here to use it. It's an agreement that mobile networks Providers actually provide support free of charge, and we must speak at the, at the coffee break, um, to um, organizations providing humanitarian assistance, which is huge potential, right? So it means that you can actually tap into mobile networks in various places um, for free, and mobile network providers actually provide that assistance. So it's anyone who's part of the network. So it's about using that, those sort of global agreements that we have in places and applying them where it's actually relevant, but also using the systems that we have and the structures that we have to really making sure those conversations take place. So obviously, through our facilitation of humanitarian country team uh, meetings, through our chairmanship of intercluster coordination groups, uh, but also through our work with um, the clusters, the AP frameworks, those those would be all the things that are applied. Now, the question is, of course, I'm going to throw it back to you. Is it working and what's not working? And if it's not, then we really should um, be looking at what we should be doing better. 
Yeah, because I, I think, you know, when it comes to like some levels of change management when handling projects, there's the realization of that we need to change. But then you go in and you realize the appetite is not really there. Is there that appetite to change? I mean, there's the realization we have, we need to change, but is there really that appetite? Group therapy, honest conversation. <laughs> I love the group therapy. Um, so I think there is definitely an appetite. Look, I mean, appetite. Um, appetite sounds like there is a hunger. I think there is a must, right? It's not a question of whether I have an appetite. It's a question I have a responsibility as a humanitarian um, to actually do this. It's not a question whether I want to or whether I'm hungry for it. I, I've got to. And I think that message that comes down from people like Martin coming down, it's not a question of wanting, it's a question of having to. It is what is what should be part of our DNA. Um, I think there's definitely um, a lot of goodwill. But you know what they say, the, the pathway to hell is paved with good intentions. I think it's about really being practical and really um, calling ourselves accountable. And as my colleague has said, wanting to listen to things that we don't like to hear. You know, this is the thing. When you get feedback, you don't always just get praise. Often you, you get things which are not praised. So I think we have massively, I don't know about you, <laughs> <laughs> so I think what we have, I think, massively advanced on is this um, realization that we need to get the feedback um, and realizing that we have that responsibility if we haven't realized it. And I think a lot of people realize. So I think there is definitely that appetite. And I can say in Ocha, it is definitely that appetite. Um, I think it's more how do we actually practically do it and what does it look like in practice? And I think that the tricky thing there is how do we work together? I know it sounds so simple, but we actually, we don't always play nicely in the sandbox. We are often more worried about you know, our reporting, how our organization is going to look and so on. Um, whereas I think that shift of focus of what should be driving us, um, you know, in an ideal world, we'll be putting on all our evaluations on one heap and looking at them together. Do we have that ability? I don't know. But at least talking through what we're going to change is, I think, critical. Um, thank you. And just to conclude on your on your question, so uh, with the challenges that are there in Kenya, there isn't really a country team for Ocha in Kenya. So we can discuss that more. And hopefully Martin is not here, so no reporting of the leadership that needed to ensure that there's a country team. So I'll come back to you, um, Tristan. So I think since yesterday we've spoken at length about um, really the, the need to include lo local organizations, local communities, local um, local actors. And, and it's because they are actually currently that not playing a key role, they're not in the front or not included at all. So where do you really see the entry points for local organizations, local communities into the decision-making table? Okay, you can hear me. Um, I think there's two aspects of this. One, I think, and I think one of my colleagues mentioned it, um, is making sure that they're actually capacitated as the first responder. So our humanitarian funds getting to them. So there, I had mentioned this surf example during COVID. There's another one, the Rapid Response Fund, which is actually in Sudan, South Sudan, and Ethiopia, um, which gets immediate injects immediate funding for rapid response into a crisis uh, for national NGOs, uh, community-based organizations on the ground so that they um, can actually be uh, key in actually the response because they know the area. So capacitating them to be able to be part of that humanitarian infrastructure and have the resources to, to act upon it. I think another area that, uh, you know, IOM has has just started piloting is called a participatory or community-based planning um, approach, which is basically participatory programming. And so this is uh, being piloted uh, globally for us uh, in our programming right now, which puts community leaders and members of the community in in the planning process for programming, uh, whether it's a migration uh, flow crisis, a displacement setting, or uh, within the planning structures for development planning and return areas. 
And so this is something that the administration has endorsed, but more importantly, um, as you, IRC was talking about, was is like embedding it within the way that we do work. So it's not just about a policy saying you must do AAP, which can go in one ear and out the other, but it's actually, this is how we're going to approach this programming. This needs to happen in order for us to feed into the larger development plans to go from humanitarian into development. Um, so again, we're at the initial stages, but I think having that um, a dual approach of making sure that that local responders actually are embedded within the humanitarian architecture and have the resources to do so, but also when we are doing our programming or through implementing partners to make sure that that community consultations, uh, not just a focus group discussion, but really embedding on the design uh, is completely incorporated into how we do business. So those are a couple examples, I think, of, of I think, points that we should be emphasizing. This is just the IOM approach, but it might be relevant for the broader. Yeah, um, so like, it sounds, I know you're still at the piloting phase, but I'm gonna use some of the things that like local organizations can be able to do because I know there's this discussion that when working with local organizations, these usually call them the big guys. The big guys sometimes do not have the patience because uh, the local organizations do not have adequate structures. I know somebody yesterday said we don't really like to say capacity building. It sounds mm -hmm. snobbish. You know, it's like, oh, we're coming to help you. You know, we'll show you how to be able to get this done. But how would you advise like big organizations when trying to work with local organizations to try and bring that shift? What should they keep in mind? Because there's usually this thirst to get things done. And I'm sorry, I'm using words of hunger, appetite and thirst. But what do they keep in mind like working with local organizations to be able to make it work? I think let's use Afghanistan as an example. Um, we have a completely new operating environment. Uh, there is a need to... I shouldn't use capacitate, but we need to have a strong social infrastructure. We have a lot of NGOs, um, actors that are now suddenly underground. Um, there's a need to bring female staff onto all of our agencies. So investing in individuals um, who are being brought on to our, our organizations, whatever organization you have, uh, particularly women. I'm, I'm going twofold here. Um, bear with me. Uh, so simple. Um, I think it was Save the Children, who has the best rate of hiring women in Afghanistan. I think half of their staff is women at this point in time. And it takes an innovation or innovative way of looking at it. What are we doing in our vacancy notices? Does everyone need an engineering degree? What's the, what's the rate of women having engineering degrees in this particular context? Let's invest in these individuals because they know the context, we need them to access 50% of the population, and we want to feed back into the local communities and empower them as well. So investing in individuals who may not be the ideal candidate on paper, but let's take a chance and build up, right? Um, second thing goes with, with uh, partner agencies themselves. We need to have a strong infrastructure. We should not be doing the direct implementation ourselves or only through international agencies. So part of that means, you know, um, spending extra time doing um, trainings on how actually your organization will expect the financial and administrative um, functioning of a partner. And that's just the reality. We all have donors. We have to report. There needs, there is a, 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 a set of systems and controls in place. And, uh, rather than not just partnering with certain agencies or local agencies because those ideal control mechanisms aren't in place, why don't we help build them so that there is an awareness? Um, and so investing in the broader communities as well, regardless of whether or not they're going to be your partner, we still as a community need to have an enhanced uh, social service network that's available uh, because a handful of agencies can't and should not be trying to, to provide assistance for all. We need to develop the broader, broader. So I think we need to take a chance and invest in individuals and uh, networks. Yoshia? So, I'm right. Um, 
so communication technologies um so they have quietly and decisively changed the way uh communication and community engagement uh, and accountability landscape has changed in the past two decades um i remember when we were just having a quick chat and i kind of figured out how old you are and how long you've been in irc so you've seen that change happen so in your opinion uh, do we have that depth of knowledge and skills to be able to understand this system-wide change? Yeah, and that's a, it's a great question. Um, and thanks for outing me in terms of my time at the IRC. Just to, to, to put this in context, I, I received my first email whilst working for the IRC. So just to... Um, uh, yeah, so I, so I don't think we're fully... No, I don't think we're ready, and I don't think we're fully... I think we're lagging behind the changes that are already taking place. I, I say we in the in the broader collective here of, of uh, both IRC and, and the, the wider sector. Um, but I think some of the things where I've seen great movement and great um, uh, innovation, as uh, you know, we, we touched on some of these already, but, you know, around how um, information is provided and disseminated. Signpost, uh, Andre is, Andre is uh, our director of the Signpost uh, project and, and well worth cornering in a, in, a, in a coffee break or, or at lunchtime to, 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 to sort of dig into what Signpost is doing. But that's a great example of um, meeting people where they're at and communicating in uh, ways that make sense to um, People on the move in a variety of, of different settings. Um, there's other great examples of how um, technology has helped to drive better um, coordinated uh, communication around, for example, outbreak responses and, and such like. So we have individual good examples, but that that's not to say that there aren't challenges that come with. Back to that in a sec, but um, I mean, I, and I guess yeah, as I've, I've as I've said before, we've got we have much more data and much more ability to visualize data, which can include some very positive flow of information in to organisations from community. So plenty of good things going on. I think there's been a a, a movement of um, of skills either through uh, hiring different people or through partnering with different agencies or both um, to actually kind of drive our ability as individual organizations to to move with the times and to to leverage these changes but there are a whole set of um, ways in which I don't think we're ready and I don't think we're on top of things some of these are um, some of these are problems that existed before but perhaps just acquire a different flavor in a in a more tech driven or, or in, in newly um, in, uh, are mediated differently using different technologies and others are problems that are quite specific to these new technologies. So starting with the latter category, the stuff that's very specific where I feel um, we're not on top of things, I think first and foremost is data protection. I think that's the big kind of time bomb. We've seen a couple of explosions already with, uh, um, uh, with a certain agency based in this fair city that got hacked or um, another agency based in this city that shared large amounts of data with a neighboring government that you know, identifiable data that allegedly had been given with consent, but one wonders what that consent looked like and, and, and how that actually played out. So, you know, two, two big high profile cases around data protection. But if I look at the data protection landscape and if I look at that across um, the, the many, many different systems and uh, uh, situations that we operate in just as a single agency, I'm worried and I'm worried uh, enough to be trying to kind of put more investments into this to say, actually, we need to get on top of this because um, we have own organically and um, without, without really, without having a systematic approach to, to data protection. And I think that that's going to come back and bite us. So that's, that's one thing that worries me uh, for the industry as a whole, but for, for, for us as an organization. Um, another thing that's specific to, um, 
technology, I think, is this sort of fetishization of the the medium that happens. So people get awfully excited about new stuff. Uh, and it's it's absolutely wonderful to be sitting on a panel where, you know, the, the one of the sort of preeminent agencies that has been driving the use of radio across the context, uh, you know, a better use of radio across the context in which we work is 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 represented. Radio just doesn't get airtime to to play with words. I mean, it just doesn't get, uh, uh, you know, no one's no one's talk about radio anymore. That, that seems kind of sad and misplaced. So so we we again, it's like a version of being focused on the input or the medium rather than on meeting people where they're at and and makes sense for them. So those those two really jump out at me. And then the other, I guess, the other things that that worry me, um, and those are just sort of look more general problems we have in the industry that that come up in in different ways. One is the coordination challenge, right? It's 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 much easier to ask more people with more information than it was before. Um, so yes, we all used to sort of lament the many different feedback boxes or the many different posters sort of saying similar but slightly contradictory things that were plastered up in the same place. Replacing that with many different WhatsApp messages doesn't solve the problem, right? So we still got uh, issues of coordination internally within organizations, externally across organizations to make sure that we're not just sort of drowning people in ways that we ourselves suffer from uh, in our, our, own, uh, our own lives. Um, and I guess the the other thing that just um, I want to flag as well is the sort of garbage in, garbage out um, uh, principle. And, you know, we've learned, you know, to call out another organization that I think is doing, you know, sterling work. Um, Translators Without Borders has done a lot of work demonstrating how we're using the wrong language to communicate in a variety of different contexts. And, you know, again, tech gives us an ability to just make that mistake on a larger scale. And so how are we actually, um, you know, are we, are we really tailoring our interventions in ways that are, that are suitable? Are we meeting the, the end user where they're at? Are we, are we understanding what their experience of, of these things are? But those are? Those are some of the challenges I think that we're not on top of, never were on top of, but now the scale is much larger in terms of the potential effect of these are things that I think we struggle with uh, as a country. Thank you. Um, so last but not least, to come back to you, uh, Caroline, I think you spoke uh, quite well about inclusion and on many different things, including languages, in a way that it actually mirrors um, the communities that we serve. What really would be your recommendations on the tangible steps that all of us can take to really mirror the communities that we serve in the work that we do in recognition of um, the challenges of how we are currently structured and, and working? What tangibly can we can we do to to mirror the community? Um, well, of course, and and it's been said, uh, you know, working from locally based with locally based people. Um, you, in the last twenty years, we we see the difference. I can only speak from the media landscape. I don't know the the humanitarian landscape as well. But um, you know, twenty twenty five years ago, you would go in in a country in a region, and you would have many few media. Um, there was no digital uh, elements, and the the political opening um, was just beginning. So the media flourish with party and and a sense of democracy growing and so now you if you arrive somewhere maybe not north korea but never try but uh, you will find local media so you have first to to work and start with them um looking at their strengths and their weaknesses if you know as a community they exclude others because they only want to talk to their community um and i can think of some uh elements in ERC, for instance, where now community radio um, really trying to more like nationalist vis-a-vis -vis what's going on with Rwanda, though it is not their role because the community have always been cross borders in 
that region. So you have to start from there. Um, and it's, um, it's also, uh, it, it was said, you know, um, it's very hard sometimes to find a producer, a journalist, or a, a speaker in X language or that has the, the minimum required training to, to work in the media. Um, we see this in Central African Republic, uh, trying to have more Muslim people in our newsroom. The structure is that Muslim people have less education, they have less access to services, so in the end, in the market, they are less uh, present try to have qualified people. So yes, you have to take the risk of uh, investing in people, hiring people, spending time training people that are not right away uh, fit for maybe the job you want them to do. But that's investment for the long term and that's investment that are uh, strategic, but also coherent with the, the mandate and the vision. It takes time, it takes more resources. And very often when you have someone well-trained and um, that is, um, you know, again, I don't like these words, but checking many boxes in terms of minorities and gender and everything, the UN comes and hires. So um, I think we will end here because of, of time. Thank you very much to our esteemed uh, panel for sharing your insights, your experiences, and really looking forward to how all of us can grow change to achieve the, the common vision uh, that we have to, to move forward and future-proof uh, CCEA. Thank you, Asanteni.